Assalamu alaikum, uh, viewers. This is Safras Karni from Pehami Hub. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Umar. How are you? Assalamu alaikum, brother uh, Assalamu alaikum. Safras. Assalamu alaikum, sister Hinna. Thank you. Hinna is also here. So today, brother Umar, we are doing a program. Our topic today will be uh, what is Muhammad of Hadith versus Muhammad of the Quran. I want you to please uh, share your research with our audience about this important subject. Uh, certainly. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, brother, once more uh, for giving me the opportunity to share these uh, these uh, ideas or these facts, rather, especially in today's program. Um, I think that uh, I'm just cleaning my eyeglasses to put a better one. Uh, so um, so we can see better. <laughs> May Allah make us those who uh, see better and talk better. Allahumma shadha li sadri wa salli amri wa hlul aqdatan min lisani. This is a beautiful dua. Right. Uh, yeah. the, the, uh, we, we see that uh, we as Muslims grow up in a culture, most of us, in a culture full of contradictions, as, as if we have uh, adopted or succumbed to, uh, the, to, to this culture of of uh, that involves so many contradictions and uh, and the, the, there's a danger in that uh, in in uh, in mathematics i like to refer to it because it's the language of reasoning uh, uh, which, uh, which is the language of that engineers use to build bridges uh, if if they, they cannot be contradictions in any equation in any mathematical system in any engineering system uh, when you build a bridge, the bridge either has to work or not work. Right. Uh, the bridge cannot work and not work at the same time. So the concept of contradiction uh, had been embedded, had been accepted uh, into the psyche of of the majority of Muslims. Uh, in and what has what has strengthened the the roots of this concept is uh, the 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 so called Islamic tradition that has sprung uh, throughout the years to justify or to try to reconcile the contradictions between what has been transmitted to us uh, as prophetic sayings. And this had been actually elevated to the level of quote-unquote science. It has nothing to do with science, but it had been elevated and labeled as science. So you see uh, uh, books written about the ahadith that are contradictory to each other and how to reconcile them. Right. Mm -hmm. You have uh, uh, literature, material, quote-unquote Islamic material, that had been written about ahadith that contradictory to the Quran and uh, how to reconcile them. And as you all know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the who ended up winning was the Hadith. So the Hadith ended up, uh, Hadith ended up being the upper hand or the marja or the reference for our religion under the pretext that, oh, no, 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 we cannot understand the Quran the hadith came to explain the quran and this is a huge fallacy this is a this is a serious deceptive uh, proposition this is a fallacy okay the hadith didn't okay the hadith came largely to contradict the quran and and i hope i can show some of that <clears throat> so you you're saying brother umar that the hadith uh, volumes we have several volumes so one volume says something and another volume comes to justify that volume? Not or? at all. Not, I will go even further. Within, within one sub-chapter in these volumes, in these hadith uh, 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 books, within one sub-chapter, a collection of one of a group of hadith under one theme, they contradict each other. Oh. <laughs> it's it's amazing. I mean, let alone between chapters. Okay, mm -hmm. so so this is something. Uh, 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 this this so-called science of reconciling contradictory hadith, and then when they could not 
reconcile contradictory ahadith and they could not reconcile uh, certain ahadith with the Quran, they came up with what we covered extensively before, the concept of abrogation. In other words, they are willing, the hadith framers, the creators of the parallel religion, they are willing to nullify the words of Allah in order to champion and to have the hadith come as the upper hand as the arbiter in the affairs of Muslims. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's extremely serious and very sad state of affairs. You see, whereas Allah said, I sent you this book as Huda, Muslims decided that, the majority of Muslims decided that uh, the Huda is, is not the Kitabullah, it is something else. But before I, I go further, I'd like to mention that there are three types of you know, if, if, if there is some information in the Mus'haf and you come up with, when if you add to it, okay, then you really committed a forgery. Right. If you contradicted it, you're contradicting the Mus'haf. Right. So you, you now an example, a quick example, and, and a very, very illustrious and important example, is the the iman the concept of iman and let us emphasize that religion is not iman and this is this is a, an issue that we struggled with many muslims struggle with when they debate non muslims right. faith faith is synonymous with religion in islam faith should not be synonymous with religion faith is iman religion is deen two separate things you know Allah asks us, and now you'll know in a second why I'm saying this. Allah asked us to, to have Iman in five things. Five. Now, I'm not going to go the details and, specific, and, and discuss what are these, but very quickly, you know, Iman Billah, Allah, Malaika, the angels, Kutub, the books, and Rusul, the, the prophets, messengers, and the messengers. And the fifth is the uh, day of accountability. Al mm. Akhirah. Right. The latter day. Okay. Now, these are five that Allah specifies in the Mus'haf. Now, when you have a hadith that comes and adds a sixth item to them, it means that it is not explaining. It's not. You see, the, the, the hadith in Muslim gives you six items that are the pillars of Iman. Or Islam. I mean, there's a confusion about which one is which. Six items. The five are copies, copy paste from the Quran. Okay. The sixth is an addition. Is this an explanation? No. It's a forgery. Okay. So, and taqulu Allah says, He warned us, and taqulu Allahi ma la ta'lamun, and taqulu Allahi. So this fits under that category, which is, according to Allah, is haram. It's haram. There's no if and but about it. Okay. So explanation is different from contradiction. Explanation is different from forgery. And let's make that extremely clear. So if I tell you, for instance, and I will discuss this, if, if a woman... Uh, if a woman cannot do something, if the Quran says the woman can do something, and the Hadith says the woman cannot do that thing, there's definitely a contradiction. Right. And we have to pause. We have to say, wait a minute. I mean, I cannot have two contradictory references to my life. You know, because if I don't have a reference in my life, that's the cause for mental illness. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I'm crazy. Are you you and not you at the same time? These are simple things that Allah has built inside of us. You know, what they, what, what they call logic. It's very simple. Okay, so uh, l let's see some of these examples that shed light on this culture, on, 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 on what led to this culture uh, of, of, of accepting contradictions. You know, when, when, when you accept contradictions, the, the, the major, the travesty, the, 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 the sadness is that, first of all, you're doing something completely contrary to the, the way the brain works. 
And second, you completely forget about the, the, the importance of precision. These two things have really shaped the culture of Muslims. We don't care, you know, at the end of the day, who cares, right? At the end of the day, who cares? I, I heard that many times from many people when I try to ask them, you know, explain this verse to me, this doesn't make sense and so forth. At the end of the day, they say, you know, the, their, their reaction is that, so what? You know, who cares? Okay. Uh, Brother Omar, <laughs> it's very puzzling for me. You know, first of all, they add something to it. And there's also, they're doing the contradiction, you know, and then they try to justify that. I don't understand, never understand how yeah. they can justify addition plus the contradiction. They, 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 they justify it by creating what is called a, a new science. <laughs> a new science. And notice, if you parse their justification, it's all hearsay. You know, in other words, she said, he said. And mm -hmm. then we need someone who comes hundreds of years after the Prophet's death, like a Nawawi and Al-Asqalani, to interpret for us what was hidden from the Ahadith. I mean, people took it, you know, people, right. people, people, the, the Amawid and the Abbasid, not to de uh, uh, deviate from the subject, threw the bait. And many Muslims took that bait. And we're still suffering from <laughs> the consequences of that bait, which is, which is what led to a parallel, really, religion. If we look, for instance, as, as, as a case in point, uh, and here, here, here are some examples. We don't want to talk in, in vacuum. Here are some examples. Uh, was Muhammad uh, the, uh, the, uh, the last uh, or final messenger? We talked about this briefly but before, but I bring it as an example. As an example. Uh, Allah says in a verse in Surah 33, chapter 40. I'm sorry. Uh, Surah 33, verse 40. I used to say chapter and then verse, but I re redefined my understanding. And I think that we should call it Surah. I can explain mm -hmm. that later on. Right. Surah is not a chapter. And uh, we can discuss this later on. But let's say Surah 33, uh, verse 40. Allah says, أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ Muhammad was not uh, the father of any of your men. I'm loosely translating it. Our interest is not the precise translation here, but the theme. وَلَكِنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمْ النَّبِيِّينَ But he is Rasulullah. He is the messenger. What, he, uh, what, messenger of Allah and Khatam and Nabiyin. Khatam, whether it's seal or the final, either way, it is Khatam and Nabiyin. If we were to take it as seal or final, either way, but it's referring to a Nabiyin. Khatam and Nabiyin. Allah never said that he's Khatam al Rusul. Right. Rusul is different from Nabi. That's a very and, good point. Yes. Yeah. And not every Rasul is. Not every Rasul is Nabi. Uh, this is a common understanding, and that's not correct understanding. Why? Because in Surah 19, verse 51, Allah says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مُوسَى And mention in the book Musa, إِنَّهُ كَانَ مُخْلَصًا وَكَانَ And he was Rasulan Nabiya. If, if every Rasul is a Nabi, then Allah didn't need to say, وَكَانَ رَسُولًا Nabiya. Allah would have stopped at Rasula. Okay? In other words, every Rasul is a man or a woman, is an insan. So Allah doesn't need to say, Wakana Rasulan insanan. You see? So that's logic. But here Allah says, Wakana Rasulan Nabiya. So, anyways, so so Allah says in Surah 33, verse 40, Wa Muhammad ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين. He didn't say وخاتم النبيين والمرسلين. In our culture, we repeat محمد خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين. Number one, Allah says he خاتم النبيين, not خاتم الأنبياء. There's a difference between them. And the second, Allah didn't say خاتم المرسلين. Okay. 
let's not go into the implications of this. That's a different story because that's a very sensitive topic. But let's not go into that. Suffice it to say that this verse says, Muhammad kana khatim al nabiyin the seal or the final nabi. Now, look at Sahih al Turmadi. Turmadi is one of the respected hadith framers, transmitters. I call them framers. Uh, and uh, this in this hadith, uh, al, uh, the Prophet says, Inna risala wa nubuwa. Risala, the message, and nubuwa, prophethood. Qad in qata'at, it stopped. Fala rasulun ba'di wala nabi. There is no rasul after me and there is no nabi. Do you see the contradiction between the two? Full <coughs> contradiction. Right. So they okay. added the Rasul in it. They, they add, added, oh, either they add the Rasul or they forge the entire Hadith. Yeah. You know, in other words, the, the, if the, the, the messenger, if someone asked him, wouldn't he, wouldn't he bring this verse from the Quran? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be oh, sufficient to, to validate his claim that he was the Khatim and Nabiyin? He would just repeat because how, how does he know he's Khatim and Nabiyin? From the verse. Right. <laughs> how does he know? I mean, he was chosen as a Nabi or he evolved as a Nabi. That's a different story. How does he know he's the last one? He does not know the future. He does not know the ghaib as we will come to later. So right. it's right there in the wahi, the wahi that was sent to him. It says, you're the Khatim and Nabiyin. So if someone, if I were one of those people around the Prophet and I come to him, are you Khatim and Nabiyin? I'm curious. He will repeat to me the verse. Okay. So either the verse, uh, either this hadith is forged or uh, all of it is forged or part of it is forged. Regardless. The point is that this hadith completely contradicts what? The Quran. That's the one. Okay. Now, uh, let's look at uh, uh, the, the hadith. Uh, uh, the, uh, these are class of hadiths that really project Prophet Muhammad as a pedophile. Okay. So, narrated Aisha. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Narrated Aisha that the Prophet married her when she was six years old. And he consummated his marriage. Consummated, it means that he had sexual intercourse with her. When she was nine years old. <laughs> then she remained with him for nine years after that till his death. So, so this tells us that the that Prophet married... Aisha had the nikah when she was six. This is this is projecting the prophet as a pedophile. This is a hadith. This is not a Quran. This is a this is hadith that most likely was forced by pedophiles who wanted to justify justify taking a young girl who is still playing with her dolls as the other hadith, which we don't have the time to mention, that they took me, my mother, Aisha is saying in one of the hadith, that my mother came to, took me when I was playing with my dolls. Took her for what? For the marriage ceremony. It's, 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 it's really shameful to even read these hadith. Uh, now, there's another hadith. Uh, Allah is, um, um, I have married uh, a matron. He said, why don't you have a liking uh, uh, for uh, let, let me skip this because uh, they, these are these are some they, there are some ahadi that have some pornographic content that I think uh, it is <laughs> it is better to refrain from saying them but I think I made the point clear is that uh, this hadith projected the prophet as a pedophile now uh, the uh, some many many actually clergy have institutionalized this to claim that the marriageable age, the marriageable age, i.e. the age in which you can consummate the marriage, is nine. Okay? Now, what does Allah say in the Quran? I mean, Allah says, Allah repeatedly said uh, to, to, Allah says to Muhammad, Balligh, uh, you know, uh, this Quran, Ask him to to follow this. And, and and the rest of the of the of the verbs that have been used. Allah says, uh, 
I don't remember the verse number and the surah number, but it's easily findable. But uh, Allah says, وَابْتَلُوا الْيَتَامَى Test the yatama, the orphans. حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغُوا النِّكَاحِ Until they reach marriageable age. So, now, uh, uh, you know, some people will say, wait a minute, uh, it's possible to marry someone but not to have a, a full intercourse with her. I mean, that's absurd. That's completely absurd. You know, marriage has many other requirements, you know. Anyways, so here are a hadith that contradicts what Allah says in the Quran, number one. And number two, the hadith projects the Prophet as a pedophile. Now, here is a case in point where there are uh, where um, a hadith that uh, projects the prophet as a sexual uh, pervert. You know, a sexual pervert is not necessarily the one who sleeps with uh, with women or have intercourse. No, it could be other ways. So this is a hadith that uh, I uh, found it to be quite amusing and. Uh, and it's sometimes uh, very interesting when you look at the ahadith and you parse their structure, you find a good chunk that the Prophet didn't say. And the little bit that the Prophet is claimed to have said. Okay, so it's very interesting for the hadith framers, how are they going to perceive what the Prophet didn't say versus the Prophet said. Anyways, that's uh, something to to think about. So this is a, a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. And uh, it's, uh, it's a long hadith, but I will mention the few uh, parts of it. Um, uh, that the Prophet uh, visited, used to visit Um Haram, a woman who is named Um Haram. I, I'm intrigued by the name of this woman, Um Haram, the mother of Haram. The, the first what, impression that what, comes... What does exactly mean? Mother of <laughs> Haram is, is sin. <laughs> the mother of sin. The, what? what comes to me, what comes to me, really, that the closest thing that comes to me about this woman... So it's like a bad, bad, bad woman? Bad... Uh, I, 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 you said it, I didn't. Like a prostitute or something like that. You know, Um Haram, the mother of sin. Okay. I know I could be wrong, but that's the first thing that comes to me. So she would, he would come to her house and she is not his wife. She is not his mother. She is not his sister. She is not his daughter. Okay. He would come to her, uh, to, uh, uh, her, uh, her, uh, to, to her house and she would offer him meals. Um Haram was the wife of so on, so on, so the Prophet said, some of my followers, who, uh, um, you know, it's a long hadith, but I will say the gist of it is that he would come and he would sleep on her lap. And she would start playing with his hair. So that was when, while he was already married. Is that correct? You know, it doesn't matter whether he was married or not. Most likely, oh, yes. yes. No, no, no. Mo most likely, yes, because, because there was no interruption as far as I know, uh, in in his marriage life. In other words, he always had uh, women as wives, the prophet. Right. Right. So, so irrespective, she's she 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 doesn't relate to him in any way. And the, the hadith is in Al Bukhari. Anyone can check it out. It's numbered in two seven eight eight, and it's mysteriously grouped under Babel Jihad, the chapter of Jihad. Okay. Isn't that interesting? It is. Very interesting. Uh, they should have grouped it under the chapter of, uh, of anyways, don't want to make a joke here. But so he would go there and she, he would sleep. She would feed him and he would relax and he would sleep and she would play with his hair. What? And then he would wake up and he will tell her what kind of dream he had. Mm. And then he would sleep again and he'd wake up and so forth. So what's going on? What is the message that that this hadith, and it's a long hadith, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven 
uh, uh, lines of about uh, 20 words each line. Wow. Okay? And with, with, with details. Uh, who, who really, you know, when, when Al-Bukhari was, was collecting a hadith around the world, so we were told, I mean, who remembered this? Who remembered this with such uh, vividness? Yeah, yeah such uh, detailed. It such detailed. So now, now, we were told in the Quran, in chapter, in Surah 68, verse 4, You have great moral character right now is this if someone has a great moral character when allah refers to a moral character was their moral what they call moral relativism what was morally accepted accepted then is not morally accepted now i mean if that is the case that's a serious flaw in our religion serious right. flaw yes Okay, so if if I were to emulate my prophet, then it's okay for me to go to a woman who doesn't belong to me, who's not related to me, and I I relax in her house and take a nap, and she will be playing on my, with my hair, and I will nap on her lap. That's right. that's that's the kind of things that we are dealing with. Now, let's look at another example. Here is. Uh, uh, a portrayal of uh, Muhammad, our prophet, uh, as a selfish person who was interested in his own salvation. A selfish person. I mean, look when when you when you want to argue this, when you when you present this hadith, and you want to have a debate with Christians who tell you Jesus died for the salvation of humanity, and here's this hadith that I will read to you that shows a man who was selfish, interested in his own salvation. Okay. So the hadith is in Al-Kitab al-Salah, the chapter of Salah number 384, but the numbers don't take the numbers seriously because they change from one reference to the other. But in Sahih Muslim, okay, the one of the most important hadith books, okay, and it's also mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawood and other uh, Sahah. So Abdullah ibn Umar said, uh, reported Allah's messenger as saying, when you hear the mu'addin, by the way, I'm skipping the Arabic. No need to mention the Arabic ahadith. There's no point, right? Is that okay? I'm just yeah, going to right, English yeah. translation. Okay, but if, if you want me to, to go back. Oh, with, that's okay. That's yeah. fine. When you, uh, so he heard the messenger as saying, when you hear the mu'addin, the one who calls for the prayer, repeat, repeat, then he said, repeat what he says, then invoke a blessing on me. So he's saying to us, if you hear the Mu'addin, repeat what he and invoke a blessing on me. For everyone who invokes a blessing on me will receive 10 blessings from Allah. Now, if we pause a little bit here, what does Allah blessing me mean? Okay, so, so I bless the Prophet so that Allah will bless me. That the translation of this is that I bless the Prophet and the bless is translation of Sallu Ala. Mm. <laughs> Whether that makes any sense or not, that's a different story. But the Prophet saying, make Salah on me, then Allah will make Salah on you. Right. And what, what does make Salah on me means? Allah to make Salah on me means okay? okay so then beg then beg from allah al wasila for me the prophet is continuing in the hadith say beg from allah al wasila for me mm. al wasila is a high rank in paradise right which is a rank in paradise fitting only for one one of allah's servants and i hope that i may be that one that's what the prophet has said. He wants us. He wants us to beg Al Wasila for him, so that he will reach that high stage in paradise. Then he continues: If anyone who asks that I be given the Wasila, that high stage in paradise, according to them, he will be assured of my intercession. In other words, I will give him shafa. 
<laughs> hilarious, isn't it? In other words, the Prophet saying, you beg Allah to give me a wasila, that high level, then I will give you shafa'a. If you don't, I will not. <laughs> Why are you laughing, brother? <laughs> no, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so the prophet is bargaining with us. You ask that I get the wasila, yeah. I will intercede for you. And now, look at, I mean, aside from the, the bizarreness of this uh, fabricated uh, hadith, we look at uh, Surah 1779. 1779, Allah says, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ لَكَ عسى أن يبعثك يبعثك ربك مقاما محمودا and uh, and rise at the last part this is a loose translation rise at the last part of the night or the night offering additional prayers nawafil okay so your lord ربك may raise you to a station of praise yeah. that's what Allah says he didn't say anything about this content of the hadith now aside from that the intercession allah says i will grant i will choose whom i grant to intercede at the day of accountability right the intercession who will do intercession it is my prerogative that's what allah is saying look at the contradiction between what allah is saying and what the hadith right Okay, now we move to other uh, other uh, other uh, stories where we have or other subjects. Here we are. Here the hadith projects the prophet as a vengeful and bloodthirsty man, vengeful and bloodthirsty. And uh, this is an important hadith, even though <laughs> I will not read the Arabic. The Arabic is about uh, seven lines. Every line is more than 20 words. Again, how, what memory uh, these people had to transmit such hadith over hundreds of years is amazing. Let me, uh, Brother Umar, I'm sorry to interrupt you here. Before you go on, let me ask you one question. Uh, did you have any experience like uh, when they show you those hadiths and you give them the reference of those verses, did they still want to justify that they're right and the Quran is not correct? I mean, have you had any experience like that? My 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 experience varied, and I cannot generalize it, but I would say that whenever you you bring this kind of discussion to someone who is a proponent and the champion of hadith they start backing off and they invoke the non-expertise they say that oh i'm not an expert go and discuss this with an expert okay, okay. Uh, i'm not a professional you know and 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 it, it, it all of a sudden you know when you bring these very very direct arguments that show that wait a minute look this hadith is saying one thing and allah is saying something else you know either if if this hadith i mean it's very dangerous if this hadith was true i mean this is not a prophet f worth following <laughs> right if yeah. this hadith if they claim this hadith is true you know why are they following a prophet who is contradicting the message that was sent to him i am not I do not believe this hadith is true. But for someone who believes this hadith is true, they either believe that this prophet is contradicting the message that was sent to him, okay? And therefore, he is not worthy of being of having any respect. This is their own doing, not my doing. But the thing is, I'm sorry, uh... But the thing is, they're still giving him respect. I mean, respect after seeing all those uh, hadiths, which is not, you know, obviously contradiction. It, they, 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 they're they're still giving him respect after seeing all that. That's another thing I don't understand. When you see somebody, there's much, says, there's much more, brother. There's much more. The, the, when I started talking today about this culture of contradictions, you know, culture of contradictions, culture of dismissal culture of imprecision you know uh, uh, and 
you know, people dismiss these things. I, you know, <laughs> I don't know why and how. You know, in my opinion, a religion is something to be taken seriously. And this, this demonstrates to me that many of us, unfortunately, don't take the religion seriously. Don't. Don't. If, if you study a, a book of physics and you find some contradiction and you move on and you just want to get your, your degree, your bachelor degree, then it means that you're not taking it seriously. You just want the title. You just want a BS next to your name, a, a bachelor, uh, you know, a holder of a bachelor degree. There's a difference. That's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there are people like that. There are people in the world like that. But unfortunately, our collective culture, and I'm going to talk about individuals, but our collective culture is dismissible. It's okay. We don't know. I'm not an expert. No, no, it can't be like that. We're not serious about, about the religion. We need to be serious about our point of reference. We need to be serious. You know, if you tell me, if you tell me my Newton's laws of mechanics uh, are my reference, then I can go ahead and build a bridge. But if you tell me I can toss a ball and it will fly, and at the same time I can toss a ball and it will fall due to gravity, I, I can't go anywhere. I can't go anywhere. You know, the, 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 the real reason for me, for me to believe that this book is a revelation from Allah, is the precision in this book, nothing else, nothing else. There's, there's no physics that I can demonstrate in this book that will tell me, wow, I'm a believer. No, the precision, the precision in this book. And we, we, we grew up, we, we, we evolved, unfortunately, over hundreds of years to dismiss precision because you know why? When you're precise, you have to watch your words. That's right. <laughs> you have, you know, you have to be careful when you're when you're precise. You know, you uh, absolutely. And I think we should take uh, Allah's uh, message uh, in Quran very seriously. What Allah is talking about, what Allah is saying. I mean, if you see a total contradiction, there is a big problem. Uh, yes, absolutely. L l l let's look at this. Yeah, uh, you know, this uh, this uh, this hadith uh, that, that that portrays Muhammad as vengeful and bloodthirsty uh, uh, and narrated Abdullah bin Abbas, one of the, the key figures in, in, in the traditional, uh, you know, Islam, quote unquote Islam. A blind man had a slave mother who used to abuse the prophet and disparage him. He forbade her, but she did not stop. I'm, I'm doing the translation of that. Right. And, but she did not stop. He rebuked her, but she did not give up her habit. What did she used to do? She used to disparage the prophet. One night she began to slander the prophet and abuse him. By the way, this hadith is in Kitab al-Hudud, Sunan Abu Dawood. Okay. So one night she began to slander the prophet and abuse him. So he took a dagger, placed it on her belly, scary, pressed it and killed her. A child who came between her legs was smeared with the blood that was there. Look how graphic. When the morning came, the prophet was informed about it. He assembled the people and said, I adjure by Allah, the man who has done this action, I adjure him by my right to him that he should stand up. Jumping over the necks of the people and trampling the man stood up. He sat before the prophet and said, Messenger of Allah, I am her master. She used to you know, in one story, he is her husband. In another story, he is her master. Irrespective, it doesn't matter. He sat before the Prophet and said, Messenger of Allah, I am her master. She used to abuse you and disparage you. I forbade her, but she did not stop. And I rebuked her, but she did not abandon her habit. I have two sons like pearls from her. Uh, and she was my companion. Last night, she began to abuse and disparage you, so I took a dagger, put it on her belly, and pressed it till I killed her. Thereupon, the Prophet said, O oh, be witness, no retaliation is payable for her blood. Mm. Amazing. 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 So, for disparaging the Prophet, I mean, imagine, this is the Prophet that was sent rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy for mankind. Right. You enter, you enter his majlis, his, 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 
domain, his mosque, and you curse him, let's say you curse him, then, then he will put a dagger in your belly and push it until you die. I mean, this is this. You think Muhammad would have acted like that? I mean, but at the same time, they tell us the story of the person who came and urinated in the masjid, and they told him, "Let him relax himself. Let him take it easy. We'll deal with him later." Now, this is what, according to the hadith, this is what the Prophet did, who agreed on the murder of that woman who simply disparaged the Prophet. Okay. <clears throat> Allah says, Tilka hududullah fala ta'taduha, tilka hududullah fala taqrabuha in Surah Al-Baqarah, in, 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 in Surah number two. Do not cross the limits that I put for you, the punishing, punishable limits, the limits of punishment. Do not cross them. Look what the Prophet did. So he contradicted the message in a violent way. Okay. Now, in the same genre, in the same genre, uh, he is portrayed as a temperamental leader who does not follow due process. This is again from the hadith, who sought satisfaction from torture. Look, he do, he's temperamental, does not follow due process, and he loves torture, okay? This is, again, this is one of the sahih hadiths. And I'll do the translation. Anas ibn Malik, who narrated many hadiths, said some people of Okul or Orena, these are two tribes. You know, he he didn't remember the name of the tribe, so he gives us two choices. Anyways, I mean, the incident is so severe that one should have remembered the, the tribe that they did this. Okay. They came to the messenger of Allah. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know why, and found Medina unhealthy. So the messenger of Allah ordered them to go to the camels, some camels by uh, close by and ordered them to drink some of their urine and milk interesting they went there when they became well which is a message that you <laughs> camel urine is yeah, good that's okay to drink right yeah when they became well we don't know when they became well whether it's an hour a day or so forth and all of them notice when they became well they killed the herdsman of the messenger of allah the herdsman of the messenger of Allah, they killed him and drove off the camels. Uh, and, and they were in Medina. How could they have done that easily? Anyways, the news about them reached the Prophet early in the morning. So he sent people to in pursuit of them. And they were brought when they had the, uh, when they, when the day, when their day, whatever had risen high, he ordered and their hands and feet were cut off. And nails yeah. were were, <laughs> in the eye. were put in their eyes. So they poked their eyes. They made them blind. And they were thrown out into some hot place until they became so thirsty. By the way, in one of the in one of the versions of this hadith, the Prophet said, let them, don't give them water. Just let them. Okay. There were people so Abu Oil. Oilba, someone, he said, there were people who had stolen, killed, apostatized after their faith and fought against Allah and his apostle. Notice the addition is someone else who wanted to connect this with the verse that they refer to as the verse of Hiraba in the Mus'haf. It's an addendum to justify this brutal barbarity. Okay, mm -hmm. so this, the impression that you get Okay, the impression is that, first of all, where's the due process? You know, where, where's the due process? Was the Prophet so mad because they allegedly killed his uh, herdsmen? Where's the due process? Where the trial? Where the witnesses? Where the, all of that? No details. Okay. Now, uh, another one. <laughs> another one. This is fascinating. By the way, there's a book by Ibn Taymiyyah, the, the champion of, of, of Salafi. Salafism. I don't want to say Salafi Islam. Islam doesn't have Salafism or Shiaism or Sunnism. Islam is Islam, but he's the champion of Salafis. Uh, and he wrote a book. It's called Asarim al Maslul ala Shatim al Rasul. Asarim al Maslul, the, the, the severe, uh, 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 roughly the severe sword 
uh, on those who vilify the Prophet, al-Sarim al-Maslul, ala shatim al the severe sword who on those who vilify the Prophet. It's a thick book. It's a it's a it's a book of it's a book of horror. You know uh, uh, what Hitchcock's movies. You know uh, about uh, those movies that depict scenes of horror pales in comparison to the to the depiction that Ibn Taymiyyah creates in his book. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if if Hitchcock had a copy of of, uh, of Ibn Taymiyyah's book. So he uh, uh, to depict that the Prophet was temperamental and uh, and uh, and uh, and irrational. Uh, there's a, a long hadith that I will give you the gist of it, is that uh, someone used to be accused of having a, a, a zina with one of the prophet's wives. Okay, I mean, look how, how loose and how flexible and how relaxed they, they mention these ahadith. Okay? And uh, so he sent, uh, I'm giving you the summary of it, I'm not going to read it, it's a long hadith. Okay, the summary is that he sent Ali, his cousin to find out what's the deal okay so ali went and he found this man bathing in a in a in a small uh, water well okay or a small uh, 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 spring or something like that he was bathing um and uh, he told him get up get up so the man got up and <laughs> he found him without male genitalia he found him a non man oh all right so he left him he went back to the to the uh, uh, the prophet told him go and chop his head go and chop his head so then he found him quote unquote not a man so he concluded that he what was said was a hearsay about him now where is the due process where is the shuhada where is the witnesses where is all of that i mean the prophet just gives a an order to go and kill a man based on hearsay. So imagine, according let's 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 take the story a little bit further. Imagine if Ali did not tell him get out of the pond, <laughs> and he just chopped his head immediately. Right. He would have fulfilled what the prophet asked him to do, right? right? So, anyways, this is this is a, a story that Ibn Taymiyyah champions. I mean, all of these stories. So who knows who cooked them? You know, uh, these are licenses for sheer terror, for sheer terror that completely contradicts the Mus'haf because the Mus'haf said, "Do not cross my limits in punishment," and those who cross it. Have are much more sinful than those who commit the sin. You see, those who cross right. the limit. Now, okay. Now this is it's getting more exciting, and now we come to uh, a famous uh, hadith in which um, in which the prophet allows his men uh, followers to fondle the breasts of foreign women. I mean, imagine, this is the prophet that was ala khuluqin azim, high degree of moral, high moral character. So in Sahih Muslim, Kitab al rida the suckling book, Aisha reported that Salim, the freed slave of Abu Hudayfa, lived with him and his family in their house. She, uh, uh, she, uh, i.e. the daughter of Suhail, came to Allah's apostle and said, Salim has attained puberty, bulugh, as men attain, and he understands what they understand. She's hinting that he has a sexual desire. Um, and he enters our house freely. She is saying that he enters our house freely. I, however, perceive that something rankles in the heart of Abu Hudayfa. In other words, she she's saying that I think that he is trying to flirt or he has some uh, some hanky-panky in his mind, something like that. Uh, because the Arabic uh, version will give you that, that idea, but the English is kind of diluted. Um, okay, I have, whereupon Allah's apostle said to her, 
suckle him and you would become unlawful for him. And the rankling between parentheses, this is the, the English translation, which Abu Hudayfa feels in his heart will disappear. She returned and said, I suckled him. So in other words, she gave her breast to a foreign man on the pretext that right now he will be haram on her so he can enter the room anytime he wants. This is the mother of the, what? The mu'mineen. Nisa al mu'mineen. This is one of them. So the, the hadith framers have, have added explicit pornography, you know, to the, to the literature, you know. Now, so, so this is, this is in Sahih Muslim. This is in Sahih Muslim. That's unbelievable. Yes. Uh, now, of course, if one reads the Arabic version, <laughs> it's, it's more, uh, you know, explicit. Uh, the one, one cautionary point is that in many of the hadith uh, translations, the translators tend to dilute the severity of the words. I noticed that repeatedly. For instance, in, 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 in some hadith where there's reference to sexual intercourse, they replace it with intimacy. Right. Intimacy does not mean sexual intercourse. There's completely different words. So uh, here's, now we come to something even more grand. Uh, the hadith portrays, which we did, which we showed example, but this is more, as uh, Muhammad disobeying Allah's mushaf commands in a direct way. So here's a Sahih al-Bukhari Kitab al-Hayd, menstruation, women's period, women's cycle. Narrated uh, someone, uh, Maymuna, whenever Allah Messenger wanted to fondle any of his wives, okay, uh, of his wives during the period, menaces, he used to ask her to wear an izar, to put on something around her waist. Right. The Arabic version, قالت, قالت سمعت ميمونة كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أراد أن يباشر امرأة يباشر, not to fondle. You cannot translate يباشر to fondle. يباشر means to engage in sexual intercourse. Right. Look at the translation, watered it down. The translation to fondle. Anyways, so here's one hadith. Okay, here's one hadith is that the Prophet had intercourse with one of his wives during ministration. All right. Uh, another hadith narrated Aisha, the Prophet and I used to take a bath from a single pot while we were junub. Uh, during the ministers, he used to order me to put on. Izar, dress worn below the waist, and used to fondle me, whereas the original hadith said, فَيُبَاشُرْنِي وَأَنَا حَائِضْ يُبَاشُرْنِي وَأَنَا حَائِضْ To have intercourse with me while I have حَائِضْ Ministration. Look, to a hadith, okay? Uh, now, what does Allah say? Allah says, I do not have, I did not write down the verse and the surah number. It's very easily findable. It was, it had been permissible for you at the night of Siyam uh, to be a rafat ila nisaikum. A rafat ila nisaikum. What is exactly rafat here? It's translated as being intimate with your wife. Okay. نسائكم your woman sorry your woman هن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهم they are a cover for you and they are you are a cover for them and they are a cover for you علم الله أنكم كنتم تختانون أنفسكم the translation your spouses are garments for you as you are for them Allah knows that you were deceiving yourselves علم الله أنكم كنتم تختانون أنفسكم فتاب عليكم and now he has accepted your repentance. So now you may bashiruhunna. Look, the translation said, 
now you may be intimate with them. But a rafat is intimate. This cannot be intimate. So look at the difference between the two. Okay. So so you bash it. Sorry, sorry, not the difference. I brought this verse to show that you basher is not to be intimate or to fondle. So back to the two ahadith. The two ahadith says that when a woman during menstruation, one can have sex with her. Okay. Now, uh, but Allah says in the Quran, clearly, uh, you cannot do that. Right? Allah says in the Quran, uh, He prevents us categorically, He prevents men from having sexual intercourse when the woman has menstruation. See the hadith? What the yeah. hadith says, you can, the Quran says you cannot. So that's a total contradiction. Yes. Allah says, You cannot do intercourse during in the mahid. All right, now here's some ahadith where the Prophet himself contradicts uh, and, and uh, it gives where there are ahadith that are contradictory to each other. Ahadith that are contradictory to each other. Narrated Aisha, one of the wives of Allah's Messenger, joined him in i'tikaf. I'tikaf is seclusion, typically either in the masjid or at home. And she noticed blood and yellowish discharge from her private parts and put a dish under her when she prayed. So this hadith tells you that woman had menstruation and she prayed, right? right? Okay. Now here's another hadith. It's a long hadith. It's a long hadith, but maybe it's worth reading part of it. Uh, this hadith narrated Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, one, uh, once Allah's messenger went out to the musalla the place for prayer, to offer prayer uh, of Eid al-Adha or al-Fitr prayer. He didn't remember. Then he passed by the woman and said, Oh woman, give alms as I have seen that the majority of the dwellers of hellfire were you. He's saying that the majority of people in the hellfire are women. They asked, Why is it so, O oh Allah's Messenger? He replied, You curse frequently and are ungrateful to your husbands. Uh, and are ungrateful to your husband, I have not seen anyone more efficient in intelligence and religion. Uh, sorry, I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you. A cautious, sensible man could be led astray by some of you. Look how he perceived women, according to them. The woman asked, O oh Allah Messenger, what is deficient in our intelligence and religion? He said, it is not the evidence of, isn't it not, is not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? They replied in the affirmative. He said, this is the deficiency in her intelligence. He continued, isn't it that, isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menses, her administration? The woman replied in the affirmative. He said, this is the deficiency in her religion. That aside from the other strange messages in this hadith, what matters to us is that this hadith says that a woman cannot pray. Right. Whereas during the administration, you know, and the other hadith say... They're contradicting each other. I mean... Exactly. Yeah. Now, here's quickly about conversion and forced conversion. Okay, uh, Allah, uh, the Prophet uh, claimed to have said, "Man uh, uh, If a somebody, if somebody um, discards his religion, kill him. The typical interpretation if that the person who changes his religion is a Muslim. If the Prophet said, according to them, "Man Whoever. Uh, discards, it, actually it's not discard, whoever replaces his religion. When you replace, it means that you're replaced with something else, right? Baddala. Baddala means to replace. Uh, his religion, assumingly with, with another religion, then kill him. But Allah says in 
Surah 18, verse 29, in no, in no unequivocal, you know, terms. Uh, I'm sorry, in no equivocal terms. قل الحق من ربكم فمن شاء فليؤمن ومن شاء فليكفر. When, uh, uh, and say and and declare not say and declare this is the truth from you lord whoever wills let them believe and whoever wills let them disbelieve actually that is a quick translation that i picked from the web but it is not precise uh, this is the truth from you lord uh, from your lord whoever wills let them believe and whoever wills, let them cover the truth. Okay, so there's an option, right? There's a clear right. option. option. There's a clear option. option. Mm -hmm. In Surah Baqarah, Surah 2, verse 256, Allah says, La ikraha fi deen. La ikraha fi deen. Mm -hmm. the, instrument of the instrument of compulsion does not exist in religion. Right. Contrast these two verses in the Mus'haf with whoever replaces his religion with another religion, he should be slaughtered. Right. All right. Uh, I want to mention very important, another important uh, contradictions, very important, very brazen contradictions, very explicit. Uh, when, when they ask, when they claim, when the, uh, 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 this is regarding the ahadith that claim the prophet uh, made water spring out from underneath his fingers. Okay, the hadith narrated Anas. It's an instance Sahih al Bukhari. I'm not bringing, by the way, very obscure ahadith. I'm bringing them from the Sahih, the so-called Sahih, right. the most credible, the most authentic, the most quote unquote authentic. The, the, the pillars of the parallel religion. That's what I refer to them, the pillars of the parallel religion. Uh, and narrated Anas ibn Malik saw Allah's messenger when the Asr prayer was due and the people searched for water to perform ablution, but they could not find it. Later on, a pot full of water for ablution was brought to Allah's apostle. Okay. Uh, I don't know why they say Allah's apostle. It should be Allah's messenger, Rasulullah. Okay. He put his hand in the pot and ordered the people to perform ablution from it. I saw the water springing out from underneath his fingers till all of them performed the ablution. It was one of the miracles of the Prophet. This is cited repeatedly as one of the biggest miracles of the Prophet. Mm. Look how brazen this hadith is. Let's look at 17, Surah 17, verses 90 to 93. لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوعًا And they declared, they uttered, they declared to you, we will not become believers in you, until you make water spring, until you create a spring of water. Look, yes. this is 1790. Look how the contradiction between this and the hadith that I just said, uh, 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 read in Sahih al-Bukhari. I mean, how brazen can it be? Unbelievable, yeah, sort of <laughs> <laughs> Allah said, uh, okay, and a continuation of this verse, because uh, of these verses, there are four of them and they're really important. I like them so much because they really answer these framers of the hadith in a direct and explicit way. I will not go through the second uh, uh, verse because they asked for more. They want Jannah, they want a garden. Right. Naab. Okay, the third one, they asked him, and تسق, to bring the, the sky on us, to have the yeah. sky fall on us. 
كسفا او تاتي بالله والملائكه قبيله او يكون لك بيت من زهره في they go on and on Allah is saying or you, you, you have you bring for you a house made of uh, fully ornated او ترقى في السماء or you ascend to the sky dot 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 at the end the end of the of the verse verse 93 surah yeah. 17 yeah. Yeah. هل كنت إلا بشرا رسولا declare سبحان ربي was I not but a بشرا رسولا in other words I cannot do any of the things that you asked me yes. and look at the hadith that we read before that it was so clear in this ayah. Okay, now of course there are a lot of hadith that talk about the Prophet uh, that mentions the Prophet knowing the ghaib, the unseen, the future. These are the most bizarre and captivating hadith. People make money out of these hadith because they're so fascinating. People, you know, if you want to grab people's attention psychologically, talk about fear. Right? Talk about fear. Why people watch, uh, uh, you know, CNN loves to, to put uh, always fearful news items so that people come back to it. <laughs> you know, it's a psychological... I mean, it's amazing, Dr. Omar. I mean, it's so clear. In, uh, Surah 17, 90 to 93, is so clear. Allah is saying, you cannot do that, period. He's saying, I cannot do it. But the Hadith saying he did it. <laughs> it's totally... I mean, what, 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 what more can one say? I mean, there's there's nothing to explain. <laughs> I mean, you're so, saying Allah's, uh, you know, message, Allah's, you know, saying clearly, you cannot do this. Yeah. You cannot do that. He was saying also, I cannot do this. I mean, they, they, they were so away from the Mus'haf, the Hadith framers, they were so away from the Mus'haf that didn't even check to see that this Hadith is so brazenly contradicting a clear verse in the Quran. They could have, they could have, you know, they could have twisted a little bit, but no, they, they, they were so far away from the Quran that that they fell in this uh, trap. It's it's like a person who is lying, you know. So that's what, you know, that's what I asked you in, initially in the program before, when you had this kind of experience, when you show them this those verses from Quran, and th they talk about those of these. I mean, you have. And on their faces, the words yeah. from Allah, how can they justify something, you know, from what they're saying on Hadith? I don't understand. I mean, the, the, this, I think, uh, this, I, I cannot comment about the hearts of people, but I can talk about myself, is if I'm serious about uh, the words of Allah, I take them seriously. I try to understand them, and I want to be comfortable with them. I don't want to to live in a world of contradictions. I can't, you know what? If a person, God forbid, if a person lives in contradictions inside of him, the, the ultimate is to, to take one's own life. You know, you kill yourself. If you, that's that's suicide. You, you're living in a, in a constant contradiction. You want to relieve yourself. In the case of religion, you know, suicide, as far as religion is to leave it. You know, if, if, if the religion is full of contradictions, you leave it. You say, I'm sorry. You know, Allah right. says, Allah says, La nafsan illa I, I, I will put in you a responsibility that is commensurate with your capacity. And if my capacity is not to accept contradictions, then I will leave the religion, the so-called religion, naturally. You see? But, but, but Allah says, Allah says, in this book, you will not find contradictions, but you will find it in everything else. You think that uh, right now, a lot of people getting confused and they're not, I mean, leaving the, what we call a religion, I mean, Islam, the system, whatever, they're trying to leave this Islam thing and becoming totally confused and don't believe in anything because of you think this is happening because of this hadith Ab absolutely without without an iota of a doubt absolutely absolutely because you know we 
we stayed away from the Quran. We, we don't want to understand the Quran. We want to juxtapose hadith. We want to juxtapose hearsay. We want to juxtapose hearsay, a hadith from unknown people uh, uh, onto the interpretation of the Quran. Open, open Ibn Kathir's tafsir of the uh, tafsir. Now, he quickly jumps and brings a hadith. You know, he's trying to interpret the Quran based, based on hearsay, based on guesswork, based on something that took 1400 years to authenticate, such as the hadith that the Albani authenticated. The Albani, who passed away in 1999, he was a hadith authenticator. So we had to live 1400 years after the Prophet died for someone to come to authenticate a hadith for us, i.e. to authenticate the religion for us. It's a, it's, it's, it's a sham. It's, it, 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 it's absolute sham, really. And it, 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 the problem is so deep. But so, so, so contradiction is 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 that that's why they created this science of reconciling. You know, how did the Nasi Khal Mansukh come? The abrogation and the abrogated came because they did not want to understand the Mus'haf, and they inserted a hadith. They inserted a hadith to interpret the Mus'haf. You know, in other words, you you want to go to to the physics lab and you're doing a physical experiment. And uh, you're bringing a story about your father or my mother to start to, to, to understand the experiment. You're bringing something that has nothing to do with physics to try to, to, to conduct your experiment. Where will you go? Where will you go with that? You know, you, you want to bring historical documents to, under, to, to, to conduct a, a physics experiment. Where do you go with that? Nowhere. So. So smart people, you know, I find it much easier to discuss religion, broadly speaking, with, with people who have brains, even if they're so-called atheists, than with people who are not sincere about what they deal with, number one. For me, sincerity and seriousness are the key elements to have a dialogue with someone. Not, not stupidity, not smartness. No, no, no. Sincerity and seriousness. Sincerity and seriousness. And if people are not serious and sincere, I mean, what, what can you do? If people are sincere and serious, whether they're atheists, Catholics, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, whatever, then you can have a dialogue with, you can get somewhere with, you know, you can reach some conclusion with. But people who, who, who live in dogma, who live in contradictions, who live in the traditions. And Allah says, do not follow the traditions. Do not. The traditions will not help you. You know, uh, you know, people mistaken. Sometimes they look at the UK. They say, but look at the UK. The UK is a country that is based on tradition. Absolutely not. You know, that the tradition, the so-called tradition of the UK is just for tourism. You know, these uh, policemen with the big hats and the Buckingham Palace, the change of the guards and, and the Gothic style, this is just for tourism. But the UK is one of the most innovative cultures in the, on the planet. The UK is the most innovative. The best innovations come from the UK, okay? Uh, from jet engines to biomedical to you know it. But the, this so-called tradition, you know, the horses popping and jumping when the queen passes, this is... This is, this is just for, 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 for tourism, you know. So tradition doesn't help us. You know, we, we understand tradition, but the Prophet, the, Allah warns us against that. So back to the issue is that, you know, we have to be serious. We really have to be serious. When we look at, for instance, here's an example. If we look at Sahih al-Bukhari, 2956, but the numbers change. I mean, here's, here is, here's another sphere where the contradictions were inserted intentionally to support the political class, the ruling elites. Right. Not, 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 not the, the sexual perverts who want to found the breasts of foreign women under the guise of Islam, or who want to, be, to, to practice pedophilia, plain and simple, right? Uh, that's, that's one genre of people, one class, but here's a, another a hadith that were created to support the ruling class. 
Uh, this is again in Sahih al-Bukhari. Allah is saying, uh, the Prophet uh, uh, said, he who obeys me obeys Allah, and he who, who, who disobeys me disobeys Allah. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and there's already, already, I can sense problems with the hadith, but let's continue. He who obeys the chief obeys me, al-Amir. Look, he who obeys the Amir, i.e. the king, the emperor, the sultan, obeys me and he who disobeys the chief, the emir, or disobeys me. The imam is like a shelter. Uh, look, now he talks about the emir, and right now he's jumping to the imam. Are they the same, or there's a difference? That's I very mean, interesting. I mean, I mean... <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the imam rank is much higher yeah, than the nabi. Exactly. Look at this. The imam is like a shelter for those for for whose safety the Muslims should fight and where they should seek protection. See the confusion? We're not sure. The chief or the Imam? Anyway, if the Imam orders people with the righteousness and rules justly, then he will be rewarded for that. And if he does the opposite, i.e. unjustly, he, he orders people in an unjust way, make dhulm, oppression, he will be responsible for that. In other words, back off. Right. Do what the Imam says. Here's another hadith. Narrated Ibn Umar, the Prophet said, it's obligatory for one to listen to and obey the ruler orders unless those orders involve one disobedience to Allah. But if an act of disobedience to Allah is imposed, he should not listen or obey it. Look at the contradiction. The first one, you know, if he does the opposite, in other words, he does the opposite, uh, uh, which is the opposite of a justly rule, then follow him. And the next hadith, no, don't obey him. Right. <laughs> now, now uh, there, there are other hadith that are, you know, about the, 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 the conduct of war. Allah says in the Quran, in the Mus'haf, a.k.a. the Quran, uh, there's no taking prisoners in war. You either exchange them with other prisoners or let them go right yeah. uh, I don't remember there was okay you either let go the prisoners of war or you exchange them and here's a hadith that I will not go through all the details of narrating it is uh, it's a uh, uh, it's uh, it's a hadith that uh, says that someone uh, ended up in, in Mecca and obviously, this hadith implies that when the Muslims were in Mecca, because the, the Prophet entered Mecca only for a brief period after the, the, the fight against Quraysh and the conquer, conquering Mecca, and then he went back to Medina. So if there's, if there's something, so what the hadith said, which I will mention in a second, implies that this could have happened at that time, because the Prophet left. Okay, so narrated Ibn Anas, Allah's messenger entered Mecca in the year of the conquest. So I was correct. I made that conclusion before <laughs> going back to the hadith. Uh, so wearing a helmet over his head. So, so Allah's messenger entered Mecca in the year of conquest, wearing a helmet over his head. After he took it off, a man came and said, Ibn Khattal is clinging to the curtains of the Kaaba. Now, I don't know whether the Kaaba had curtains at that time. It's a different story. The prophets, in other words, he's taking refuge. He's clinging. If we were to believe the hadith, he's clinging to the curtains of the Kaaba. The prophet said, kill him. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What, this is rahmatan lil alameen, this prophet. I mean, if, if, you mentioned, if you mentioned this religion, which one of the shiuch of Azhar, the Azhar, the biggest uh, Sunni institution said that our religion, 75 or more percent of it, is based on Sunnah, then definitely not, uh, this religion is not attractive at all. That's correct, yeah. <coughs> now, this is another hadith which uh, the Salafis love to narrate because it uh, helps establish the, the dictatorship of, uh, of, uh, of dictators. It helps consolidate dictatorships, their dictatorship under the pretext of Islam under the Islamic umbrella, under the Islamic garb. Um, 
it has been narrated through a different chain of transmitters. This is Bukhari, by the way, Hadith Bukhari. Uh, through a different chain transmitter on the authority of blah 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 uh, who said messenger of Allah no doubt we had an evil an evil time i.e. days of jahiliya and ignorance and God brought us a good time i.e. Islamic period through which we are now living uh, now living will there be a bad time after this good time he the holy prophet said by the way this hadith many many clergy love this hadith uh, the Prophet said, yes, will there be a good time after this bad time? He said, yes. I said, will there be a bad time after good time? He said, yes. I said, how? Whereupon he said, there will be leaders who will not be led by my guidance and who will not opt, adopt my ways. There will be among the men who will have the hearts of devils in the bodies of human beings. I said, what should I do? Messenger of Allah, if I happen to live in that time, he replied, you will listen to the Emir and carry out his orders. Even if your back is flogged and your wealth is snatched, you should listen and yes, pray. So, so here is an Islamic, I call this Islamic dictatorship. Right. <laughs> justifying, yes. justifying. Now, let's remember what Allah, what, uh, uh, Allah says in the Quran about the Prophet. قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ In another verse, قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ أَيَّانَ يُبْعَثُونَ And then another one, لَا أَمْلِكُ لِنَفْسِ نَفْعًا وَلَا ضَرًا I do not, I cannot seek, cannot have, I cannot seek, I cannot uh, claim for myself goodness or harm illa ma sha Allah except what Allah wills walaw kuntu a'lam al ghayb and if I knew the hidden the unseen less takthar to min al khair then I will ask for a lot of rewards a lot of goodness a lot of benefits wa ma massani yassu and no harm will touch me of course Nowadays, if I know the future, I will uh, make millions in the stock market. Okay, so in this, in the Quran, categorically says Allah is the only one who knows al ghayb. Allah is the only one. The Prophet doesn't know al ghayb, doesn't know. Uh, and so this is a wide class of ahadith that, in full contradiction of what uh, the uh, the Quran says the hadith about the sa'ah the day the latter day uh, you know before the end of time what will happen I mean there are really tons of hadith that the clergy love to 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 go through in fine details for no reason but to to make properly to make money or to instill fear uh, in the hearts of uh, people so. Let me ask you, Brother Omar, in general speaking, when you know somebody doing bad, bad things, bad stuff, right? I'm not talking about profit right now here. I'm talking about in general. If you know this guy do bad thing, he kills people, he do something, you know, not appropriate with the women. And, you know, he's like, looks like uh, somebody who has authority and he telling you to kill someone and all that not besides uh, i'm not talking about the prophet here in general speaking how can you respect that person can you respect that person who's doing all that stuff i'm talking that's an, to that's, you know. that's an excellent point brother if 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 i want to know you know if, 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 let's take you know any religion uh, who who is the face of any religion who is the face of any, let's say christianity uh, let's say, let's say Baha'ism, let's say, uh, I don't know, some people, of course, classify Baha'ism as a religion, some don't, but let's not get into that. Uh, let's get into Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, and, and someone introduce you to the person who brought that faith, who is the face of that faith, right? Because that's, you know, that's your first introduction. Right. Uh, be before we go that, you're originally, let's say, from Pakistan. And if, if I were, I mean, this is a human nature. 
if I didn't know any Pakistanis, you're my introduction to the Pakistani culture. You're my introduction to Pakistan, period. Right. Whether I like it or not. I mean, you're, you're my introduction. I'm not saying you're everything, but right. you're my introduction. Now, let's, let's make it even more important. I go and meet uh, Imran Khan. I mean, Imran Khan is the head of Pakistan. Uh, he's the prime minister, not the president. But he will be the face of, of Pakistan. I mean, I can. I think you're getting my point. Is that no, you get you get to know? Let's say about Qadianis. Let's say Ahmadis. Let's say Sufis. A Sufi sect. A Sufi tariqa. Uh, whatever. You get to know that group from someone who represents it. Yeah. So if if I were to a non a non believer in Muhammad, uh, the first thing I would read about him. Look, before I open the, the, the Quran, which is not a trivial book, it's not a trivial book at all. Before I read, I will read something simple. What people said about him, how he conducted his affair. Was he kind to his wife? Did he allow wife, a, a foreign men to touch his wife? Was he a pervert? You know, was he a sexual maniac? Uh, uh, all of these things. Uh, so... So either I go to the Hadith, the first thing, or I go to the Seerah, the Seerah, the, the biographies of the Prophet. And the biographies of the Prophet are scandalous. They're absolutely scandalous. The, 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 the first biography was written more than 100 years after the Prophet died. And it was written uh, by Ibn Ishaq, who was commissioned by the Khalifa, I believe the Abbasi al-Mansur, al al I think, uh, who commissioned him to write a book for his son, a history book. So, of course, Ibn Ishaq must have been paid a lot of money at that time. Imagine you're being commissioned by uh, Biden. Of course, Biden is not a good example, but you're being commissioned by Mohammed bin Salman to do something. I'm sure that you, you're going to get a hefty reward for that, right? So, uh, so he must have gotten a hefty reward for writing a big, thick book about the Prophet. And many of the things that in that book were hearsay, you know, were, were attributed to people without names. Ahl al-Maghazi. Right. You know, <laughs> some people said, just like that, you know. Now, al-Mansur, the, the Abbasid Khalifas, Probably they, 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 they were enjoying the, the, the spoils of their, uh, you know, wars and women and money and drinking and all of that. And they really didn't have a chance to, 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 to focus carefully on what Ibn, Ab Ibn Ishaq did. And if Ibn Ishaq was close to the court at that time, so probably he had, he had influence. And, and others probably didn't find it comfortable and convenient to disagree with his, with his collection. Later came Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham was embarrassed by what, by, what, by a lot of what he saw. So he took a lot of it off, okay? And then came Ibn, Ibn Nas after that. I don't remember after that or before that, but most likely after that. So, th so those biographies paint a picture of our prophet you know, that is contradictory. And, and I know some people pick and choose. You know, the, those who hate Islam and Muslims and Muhammad, they pick, uh, pick se several things. Those who love Muhammad and are struggled by this, this picture, they select others and they ignore the others. And they say, well, we're not sure about the others. The bottom line, the bottom line is that the, the reality, I, I, I am very confident the reality is completely different than at the time of the prophet than the historical narrations that reached us completely different completely different and here we in in today's today's meeting we showed just going through some examples not many how many did i give okay but, but these are core examples these are important examples we cannot ignore these examples even even if there's only only these examples there then it's worth serious concern you know yeah, i think it's really worth it and you have brother omar you have done very good research you have showed some serious you know ayats in quran when allah is totally allah's message is totally you know contradicting those of these i mean that's you know people have to seriously look into the quran and see what's going on actually 
Yeah, I mean, when, when it comes to when it comes something so so you know so so brazenly contradicting the the Quran, when they asked, Allah says they asked you to to get water from yeah exactly, and He said uh, and and the Hadith said just that exactly <laughs> that's very, very the Hadith very, said you know, just that. You know, the, the, there are other aspects that we did not talk about. The, the, the hadith portrays that the people around the Prophet were angelic, were perfect men. That's not what the Quran presents. I'm sorry. That's not what the Quran. Some of them were good. Some of them were hypocrites. Some right. of them were uh, some cheaters. Guess what? Some Muslims were kuffar. There's no right. contradiction, by the way. Some right. of the Muslims around the Prophet were kuffar. Right. I can I can prove that at other times. I can show you from the Mus'haf itself. Yeah, it's in the Quran we can see that. Yes. Yeah, because kuffar is what is kuffar is to is to is to cover the truth. Right. They, by the way, kuffar is not the opposite of uh, of uh, kuffar is not the opposite of iman. Right. I mean that has to be that has to be established. Kuffar is not the opposite of iman. You know, right. this infidel, a non-believer, is, is something that has nothing to do with the Qur'an, that coinage. Right. There's no such thing as infidel in the Qur'an. There's none. There's, there's no ghayr al-mu'mineen. Right. There's mu'mineen, there's kuffar, there's this, there's that, there's mushrikeen, there's al-yahud, there's ahl al-kitab, ulu al-kitab, there's bani Israel. My goodness, it, it's, a, it's a precise book. <laughs> Yes, please, please uh, explain more. Like what the kufar means. Like uh, kufar is one. Kufar is the one. You know, there are two important words in the mushaf: kafara, uh, kufar, and kadib. Hmm. Kufar and kadib are different. Kufar, kufar is to cover the truth. That's where cover comes oh. from. Okay, to cover the truth. So you know, I am seeing Sister Hina in front of me, and at two fifty-two p.m. right now. After 10 minutes, someone will ask me at 2.52, did you see Sister Hina in front of you? If I say no, I covered the truth. Okay, right. now you let's say you're not in front of me. Okay, let's say, let, let's say uh, uh, Sister Khadija, uh, someone says at 2.52, did you see Sister Khadija? I say, I did. But I didn't see Sister Khadija, so I created something which is false. So I made kadib. I, okay. I I lied. Yeah. Do you see? So look how the precision. You know, some people say, but wait a minute. But the first instance was also a lie, not according to the Quran. No. When someone said, did you see Sister Hannah? And I did see you. And I said, no, I covered the truth. Okay. Very, you know, little difference. But there is. So what do you say, Brother Omar, about most people? When they show you the hadith, and now in our program, you show them the ayats, okay? So what do you call them, those people? They look at both, and this is the Allah's message. You show them, and they're saying, no, we see that, but it's not true. Sure. You know, brother, we, we live in a world where there's an ego. Everyone has an ego. Uh, we need to be serious about religion. Uh, we need to be serious about the truth. The truth is above you, above Sister Hannah, and above me. That the truth is eternal. The truth is part of Allah. Allah says, Anal Haq. We need to focus on the truth. You know, no matter how old we become, uh, 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 let's think about the people around the Prophet, Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan. I mean, they were leaders, right? Well established leaders. And they had to change their mindset. They had to change their mind. They had to come down from their, 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 their high heels. They had to humble themselves to accept the truth one has to humble oneself one has to clean to uh, when i i call humbleness is is to clean oneself to clean oneself for for accepting the truth we need to cleanse ourselves you know cleanse ourselves and focus on the truth not focus on the dogma not focus on but wait a minute you're shaking what i've learned all along you know, but but we can ask, but then we should sympathize with the people of the Prophet who said, you know, but you're shaking everything we've learned for a long time. You know, <laughs> right? right. It, you know, it, it takes it takes courage. It takes courage. And and people should if people are sincere about looking for the truth, Allah says, whoever wants Hidayah will get it. 
Not I choose who will have Hidayah. Who wants Hidayah will get it. Okay. But 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 Hidayah, Hidayah, I, I pray that all of us have Hidayah. I'm not saying that we are all perfect. We want Hidayah. But it needs hard work and it needs sincerity and it needs cleanliness. And it need it needs really to get rid of anything that had been introduced into our into our life as a religion. We need to have that courage. We really need to have that courage. It's a, it's it's it, it's a, it's a, really life is a serious enterprise. Religion came to help us live and carry on in this serious enterprise. It's right. it's not the other way around. It's not that life and the universe and the cosmos and the prophets came to support Islam. No, 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 no. It's the other way around. You know, all of this Islam came, the religion came to support us navigate and live through this complex, difficult, and as we spoke offline earlier, sometimes very painful uh, enterprise. If you look at, if you look at the story of Isra, Isra, uh, Isra and they, they added a Mi'raj, there's no such thing as Mi'raj, of course. Right. It's Isra. Uh, I mean, the, the Ahadith are pages long. How did people remember these Ahadith pages long? But the point here is not how they remember them, is that they asked him when that in 1790 to 93, can you ascend? into the heavens. He said, I cannot. He said, I you cannot. <laughs> so, he talked so, about, talk about the gold too. Can you have the gold and all that? Yeah, I, I actually, you know, Zukhrov, I, I think it's the better translated as a house, ornated yeah. house, you know, because the uh, I think it's mentioned elsewhere, I think. Uh, but uh, why are we not realizing, you know, if, if you were to take an engineer, any engineer, and you show him a contradiction in in the in the curricula that he studied, he will be outraged. You know, I, know. I mean, uh, people are serious. I've met engineers, scientists, and uh, practitioners, medical doctors who are so serious about their profession. But when it comes to Islam, it comes mm -hmm. to our religion, we drop that garb, so to speak, because we believe that it's it's a muddied area it's muddied it's my uh, you know I, I just remember one thing that i wanted to share with you when you talked about how uh, when you said it could be this it could be that uh, they claim the hadith framers they claim that imam ali the cousin of the prophet said that the quran is hamalu wujur people love to repeat that and that is so painful to hear al quran hamalu wujur that the quran has multiple faces you know you know, sister, if I were to tell you, Hina, sister, Hina, you have multiple faces. Would you like it? You know, it means that you're you're a hypocrite. <laughs> God yeah, forbid. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's multiple faces. You know, I smile towards you and then later I go and have something else. Can you believe it? They're proud to say that the Quran has multiple faces. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, yeah. if, if, you know, some... Just like all of us, sometimes people ask me a question about a certain verse, and I quickly say, well, I haven't read it yet. I haven't understood it, sorry. I haven't understood it yet. Why, why, why should I? Either I understand it, and my understanding could be right or wrong, by the way. But yeah. either I understand it, and I tell you what I understand, or I zip my mouth. Right. Why should I say, no, it could be this, it could be that. It could be, you know, this, it, it, it could be interpreted this way. There's a zahir, there's a bottom, there's the hidden, there's the overt, there's a covert. What? I think this is a very good point. I think that's been going on for a while. Like that's that's what I observe. If, if they don't know, they say, well, it could be this or it could be that. <laughs> you know, in, in chemistry, you put uh, Na with Cl. It could be this, it could be that. No. Allah who created who created the atoms and the molecules and everything also he's the one who revealed the Quran this is not a, this is not a book of poetry you know when Allah says this is not the product of a poet he did not imply that it rhymes so beautifully you know it rhymes so beautifully but would would the Japanese be impressed by the rhymes in 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 the Quran, I don't think they would uh, be impressed. Is it for the Japanese as well? It should be for them as well. 
Right. So what does it mean? You know, this is another chapter. Like <laughs> people do like you know poet and you know. You know no, it, it means what that. What does it mean? It, it, exactly. It means that don't perceive it. This is not the product of a poet. This is not a product of a poet. It has a complete structure. Okay. You know, the, the, the poem, the poet, the poet mm -hmm. wants things to rhyme and uses metaphors. You see, they use metaphors to make things sound right. Right. That, that with, with all due respect to poets, they're the least precise people on planet Earth. The least precise. Because their the, 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 their goal, I mean, they're wonderful people. I, I mean, I like yeah. poets. I like poetry, all of us. It, their goal is to soothe you, is to put you at a trance. Is, is to is to like you know uh, Qawwali. I love Qawwali. Uh, I mean, I love uh, you know the Pakistani culture. They love poetry. Yes. Uh, but you don't build a nation with poetry. You don't build a bridge with poetry. It it has its place. You know, yeah. it, yes. inter entertainment, uh, metaphors, and so forth. But so, I'm like saying that when this is not a book of poetry. In poetry, you can use metaphors, synonyms for a word. In Islam, in, in, in Allah's creation, there are no synonyms. You know, there's no synonyms. Nabi is not Rasul. Rasul is not Nabi. Very good point. Period. You know? But in so, the, you know, there's another, you know, verse like 3 7. People take it like, you know, the, yeah, the, uh, the yeah, metaphor and yeah, mutashabi. Yeah. And, 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 and you see, when, when Allah talks about metaphors, He said this is a metaphor. Right. He said, Daraba Mathalan. Hmm. Do you see? Daraba Mathalan. He said it. Hmm. I mean, several places in the Quran, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, surah, uh, the verse of uh, Al Kursi, Allah Nur al Samawati al Ard, Mathalin Hurika Mishka, Mathalin Hurika, Mathali, Mathali. Anyways. But right. but Allah is Allah is 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 clearly saying when He says "daraba mathalan," when He says "kamathali," uh, you know, in, in, no metaphor is a different story. If I don't understand something, I cannot say, "Oh, this is a metaphor," you know, uh, right. or 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 those who say, "Oh, it could mean this," but to another person, it could mean that. No, 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 no. That's no. that doesn't make any sense to me. What I say is that. Something in the Quran could resonate with me, and something else could resonate with you. Hmm. That's a different story. You know, something I, I keep bringing the example of my grandmother who had nine uh, kids. I mean, she struggled in her life, she had a very, very difficult life. She never went to school, but she raised nine very, very wonderful people. Uh, she, her experience in life is different. When she yeah. he hears something from the Quran, something might resonate with her that may not resonate with me because I did not go through that experience. I was privileged. I came to the U.S., studied comfortable life, right? Just like just like those who never get hungry, they right. don't understand. They don't understand what hunger is. They mm -hmm. never. Okay. Right. So there's things in the Quran that may resonate with me. Other things may resonate with you. But but I cannot say that one thing you interpret it one way I interpret it another way. It means that uh, it means that there's nothing that uh, connects us anymore as far as right. that is concerned. Yes. So okay, what do you so say about the you know the philosophers? I mean, yeah, they are in the same categories as the poets. No, no, no. But but we have to emphasize that if. Philosophers is, is a broad is a broad categorization, you know. Philosophers, uh, uh, it's a broad. I mean, sometimes we label certain people as philosophers and others as don't. Uh, philosophy is important to have a philosophical perspective in life. is 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 extremely important, you know. Um, so uh, there's a wide. I don't want to get into it, but there's a wide definition, you know. There, the, I don't think we we can agree on what a philosopher means however uh if if philosophy deals with the theoretical let's put it this way if philosophy deals with with things that are theoretical then i would say that 
then Allah is not a philosopher. In other words, he did not pose theoretical, there, there are no theories in the Mus'haf. In other words, in other words, if he wanted to prove something, he said, go search, go see, go touch, go to material things, material things. In other words, he did not prove a point philosophically. Very good point. As far as I know. Very good point. Yeah. Al-Jibal, mm. Al-Tuyur, you know, Al-Khalq, all of it is material things. Things that you see, you observe, you study. Otherwise, how can you come to realization that Allah is truthful? Right? Allah is truthful. Isn't this something that we need to ask ourselves? We need to ask ourselves, is, is this a book from Allah? I mean, I need to, 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 to answer that question myself. Is this a book, a revelation from Allah? And you know, the sad thing, this, this is a different subject completely, but the sad, sad thing is that all this clutter, clutter, it's like when you're driving and there's a lot of rain, clutter, and you cannot find your way. You know, you need to clear that clutter to find the way, to find the direction. It does not mean you found the direction yet, but you need to remove that clutter. We have a lot of clutter, a lot right. of clutter. It's, it's dilapidating. It, it's, it's, right. It curtails you. You cannot move forward. You know, you want to move forward, but they, they, they bring uh, this contradictory hadith. You want to move in this direction. You want to explore something, but they, they, they bring the alamat al sa'a. We can't. You know, we, we can't. We, we have to make, we, we really have to understand that we need a reference. We need a reference. And if, if we don't have a reference, I mean, we're really swimming. I mean, it's like it's like a ship without uh, without a compass. You know, yeah, we, we, where is reference? And 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 w whether people like to follow Islam or not, that's up to them. Allah says, uh, Allah clearly said that there's no compulsion. But 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 He wanted us to understand the facts and then make a choice. Right. Right. I always think like we should always, you know, try to go to the original, the pure thing, and that is Quran, and that's the reference. Simple. And, and, Why and, to bother and, about other things? And the Prophet said, uh, "The Wahi that was revealed to me is this book." Yes, exactly. You know, if they want to claim that the Wahi is the Hadith, no. no. He said it's this book. Right. In this book, and in another verse, he said it's the Quran. So he, this is the Wahi that was revealed to me. Right. So, right. so, uh, so, does that mean that seventy-five or eighty-five or ninety-five percent of the of the religion that we know today is gone? Absolutely. But then the remaining five percent will we we will find out that it has infinity in it. That <laughs> it will it will there will be infinity in it. Right. And once we once we you see. Uh, once we once we really go to the the spirit, the the spirit and the word of the Mus'haf, I think uh, we will be liberated. To we will be liberated, but the liberation is not achieving the goal. You need to be liberated to work towards a goal. Right. That's very well said, Doctor Omar. So I think we uh, okay. So in, again, in the end, I'm going to ask you. If you want to give a message to our viewers, what are you going to say, Dr. Rome? I think, thank you, brother. I mean, I think we should be uh, clear our intention, be sincere, be honest about our, our, our religion, take it seriously. Uh, we don't have to take it. Allah didn't force us to take it. But if you want to take it, uh, we either take it seriously or we don't take it. Um, it's uh, the, the, the contradictions, the culture of contradictions that we have evolved to accept is very dangerous, extremely dangerous. And we become, we become schizophrenic. In our profession, we will not allow contradictions. But when it comes to religion, which is much more than our profession, we allow and we live and we swim in a sea of contradictions. I think this has to, to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omar, for your time. Thank you, viewers. Our time is ending. Again, please take care of yourself, your family, your neighbors. Please listen, uh, uh, read, and understand Quran every single day. 
Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.